well. All right, I'm ready. Let's do this. <clears throat> Give it like a minute. Everyone, we'll just wait a minute to make sure everyone can log in, see, and hear. <clears throat> All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program brought to you by the Milwaukee Public Library. My name is Lydia Nimke and I'm the adult librarian at the Tippecanoe branch. Before we kick off tonight's program, just a few housekeeping items. Your cameras and microphones are inactive, but please use the chat box to interact with each other. If you have any questions for our special guest, please use the Q&A box. The chat moves really quickly and your questions may get lost. MPL staff will be on hand to answer questions about the library and if you have any tech issues. And as always, we invite everyone to sit back, relax, enjoy our panel and recommendations. Registrants will receive an email a few days after our program with a link to a recording. And without further ado, let me introduce tonight's host, Beth Gabriel. Hi, everyone. Beth, Beth is the adult reference assistant at the East Branch and a program planner for MPL. She reads and reviews romance novels both personally and professionally for Library Journal. She was recently named one of Library Journal's Reviewers of the Year in 2022. That's me. Thanks, Lydia. Um, Lydia will be hanging out in the background with everyone. Let me turn this off really fast. All right. Make sure I can see my notes. Okay. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our special guest for this evening. I'm so thrilled to host everyone. Um, I had asked Jess back when I first saw the announcement for Black Wolves Matter that I was going to be emailing her to do a library program with me as soon as it came out. And I did that and here we are, so I'm very excited. So first off, let me introduce Jessica Pride who is a contributing editor for Book Riot. And she's also the co-host of Winning Romance podcast and writes bookish things of all kinds. Um, she currently is a librarian in Southern Arizona and is the editor of this amazing collection. Thanks for being here tonight, Jess. And then we have Beverly Jenkins, who is the recipient of the 2017 Romance Writers of America Nor Roberts Lifetime Achievement Award, as well as the 2016 Romantic Time Reviewers Choice Award for Historical Romance. She's been nominated for many other awards and is amazing, and we all love her. Great author of historical romance. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Miss Bev. So excited. And then last but not least is Allie Parker, who is a writer and podcaster from Washington, D.C. She's a lifelong reader and an unapologetic romance cheerleader. You would know her from her tweets and her podcast, Romance Ever After, and currently what we're all fighting about, the rom-com bracket on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Allie. All right. So... We're all here tonight because of this amazing anthology that Jess put together, which I have right here in my hands. Do you each want to talk about what, how the process went for Jess asking you to be in this antho, or Jess, do you want to start perhaps with how you came up with the idea for it? Sure. So I um, have been a romance reader, advocate, whatever, um, for going on half my life, maybe more. Um, and I, in the past several years, have really been um, a romance reader and Twitter has allowed me to follow some amazing people and hear some amazing thoughts. And also I read a book called Well Read Black Girl, which is an anthology of essays by a Black women, I think it's all women because it's well-read black girl, 
talking about how they saw themselves in literature the first time. And I was like, I identify with so many of these things, but what about romance? None of these people read romance. Am I alone? Crickets? Um, and I thought about maybe putting together something like that. So um, after a few steps that we don't have to get into here, because I could talk about them for like hours, um, the idea was born and I started to actually ask people to contribute and that was the scariest part, but here we are. So I'm really glad that people did, especially people like the two who are with us now. Excellent. Um, when you did pitch the project to publishers, what was kind of your tagline or your elevator pitch for the book besides what you just said? It it was the I think the final elevator pitch was the the consumption of black love stories or the com the consumption of love stories in the black experience or something like that. Very good. So Miss Bevwin just emailed you to ask. I'm assuming she emailed you. We don't do phone calls anymore, do we? <laughs> how how did that conversation go and well, I, I thought it was intriguing. Um, I think I said yes immediately. I don't remember. Um, I knew of Jess. I don't think she and I had ever met before. But I, like I said, I love the idea of that because nothing like that had ever been published before that I knew of. So um, I gave her, I think she asked for some recommendations of other people who might like to be involved. And um, I don't know if, if any of them said yes or no or whatever, but I said yes. And I knew then what I wanted to do. So I just sort of waited and crossed my fingers and, and hoped that she'd get enough people and, and you know they'd be able to sell it and that a publisher would be smart enough to pick it up. So here we are. How about you, Allie? Amazing job. Amazing job, Jess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I got a DM from Jess one night. She's like, hey, can I get your email address? I want to send you something. I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, not thinking anything of it, really. I thought it might just be like some, some random stuff. And she's like, I'm trying to put together this anthology. And I want some readers in there, too. And I thought of you and I was like, oh, of course, uh, <laughs> hands down for sure. I mean, not even knowing who might be in there, just the idea of being able to offer a reader perspective. Um, I was like, all in, all in. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was an exciting process. <laughs> How long ago was the first pitch? Can you remind me? Because it, it's been a, a year, a couple of years. Time's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I reached out to um, our agent with the is this a thing that could sell question in like the summer of 2019 okay so it, it's been a while <laughs> yeah and it just came out at the beginning of this month for everyone so if anybody is watching you can go ahead and order a copy on your own or put one on hold at the library so don't hesitate if you haven't done so already so yeah that feels like a million years ago and yesterday <laughs> oh my goodness um when I read your intro essay Jess that you really talked about too about institutional and societal racism and this focus in the media and in the books that we read on white stories and white love stories and why this collection is really to show a counter to that and how there is a growing representation um, in media and books. And why was that an important focus for you and for everyone, for you too, Ms. Bev and Allie, when you were writing your pieces? Well, it was certainly something that as an adult reader, I realized my entire life had been my entire reading life had been something that was shaped by um, 
a white supremacist lens. And I, it took me 15 years of reading romance to even read my first book by Miss Bev. And so that was, um, and, and that was because of access and availability and all of that stuff that we know um, can block people from finding the thing that really shows them that there is representation of people like them, not like them, whatever they may be looking for. Um, and that was really the core of this whole book was really talking about how how it exists and we laud the existence of some amazing literature around um, Black people falling in love, but how we can still name most of the people who do it in the best way is because we don't have a wealth of it like we should. Yeah. You know, and considering when I grew up, um, mainly in the 60s, and there was nothing out there for, I mean, yeah, you had, you know, lots of love on in movies and, you know, Natalie Wood and James Garner and Mark Hudson and Doris Day. And I think the only real love story that I saw on screen was um, Sidney Poitier and Abby Lincoln in, oh God, I can't think of the title right now, but he was, he was like a gangster kind of a guy. And, oh, for the love of Ivy, that was the name of the movie. And, um, other than that, but you had love around you. You had your parents, you had your, your aunts and uncles, you had, and like I always say, you know, that that little old couple at church that was, you know, still holding hands, you know, coming out of service and walking across the parking lot to the car to go home. So you saw the examples in your life, um, but there was nothing to read it or to see it on screen was not something that was there. So um, that I am was able to put my love for love stories uh, in print. Uh, it's an amazing thing, and I'm still churning them out. You know, 28 years later, hopefully, representing the race in a way that is positive, and hoping that people enjoy seeing themselves within the context that I write. Mm -hmm. Something that always struck me about your story, Miss Bev, is that you had written a story for yourself and you were urged to submit it. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about that? I wasn't writing for publication because there was no place to get it published back then. Um, it was just for me, feeding that, that inner thing for love stories uh, for Black couples. But yeah, I was working in the library and that was what my dream was in life, was. You know, and I've told that story many times, but I had a girlfriend who had been published and she looked at my little manuscript of what would eventually be Night Song and uh, urged me to, to get it published. So, um, but had I not done that, I probably would still be writing love stories for me. Um, and that's how sort of it, it, you know, it began. I stumbled into this. This wasn't something that I had planned. So I'm having a good time. Me too. <laughs> Lots of hearts in the chat for you. <laughs> All right. Um, my notes back up here. Another theme in the anthology is everyone deserving a happily ever after. Um, which I really noticed as I was reading all of the essays and um, describe what that means as both a romance reader and what that means to each of you, happily everyone after. I mean, for me, if we're talking romance, we're talking about people together, you know, 
Um, doesn't matter what together looks like for them, it's together. And that's the most important part and that they're happy that they're together. Um, sometimes in certain books, it's about them being together with their community. Uh, I'm a big lover of books where the community is present and people are a part of their love story because that's, that's how I grew up. You know, it wasn't just your parents and you, it was your parents, your family, your mom's best friend, your dad's best friend, coworkers, your neighbors from down the street, everybody is involved in your life. And so those stories always mean the most to me when they're happy, the community is around them and we're, we're moving into the future together. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Because, you know, we, we, we see some romances and, you know, and we won't get into, you know, race or anything like that, but with some romances where it's just the, the hero and the heroine, you know, and they have no connection. Um, but when you grow up in a black community, everybody's in your business, you know, whether it's the, the folks across the street or, you know, your teachers or, <clears throat> and for me, like you said, Ali, that's sort of the beauty of it is mm -hmm. to have those connections and to see those friends and, and to see how that community shaped, you know, your, your hero and your heroine. So, um, and the HEA, and you know, and it was so interesting when I first started, I had a woman who had read, was reading Indigo. And she said she didn't want to finish it because she thought Galen was going to die at the end. So to be able, so we had to educate the community to let them know we don't kill our darlings. You know, we, we may kill a few villains, but, <laughs> you know, we don't kill our heroes. And I'm still finding a little bit of that today, but... Um, H-E-A forever. So, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just said in the chat, this isn't a Sparks novel, and I have to laugh a little. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Very true. Yep. And lots of fun comments in the chat, too, saying the community knows the couple's business before the couple knows it themselves, <laughs> which I always love, too. Yeah. Um, so in your piece, Ms. Bev, you track Black literature from slave narratives to present. Was there any fun history tidbit that you uncovered in writing your specific piece that you hadn't noticed before or want to share some of your research with our um, listeners today? The, the piece that I did for, for um, Justice Anthology was sort of a riff on um, a speech that I gave at RWA back in, I don't know, 2017, 2016, I don't remember. Um, but as I was putting that together, I was floored that Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who I had always admired, um, who's burying me in a free land I've used a lot of times in my work, wrote the first black romance. I was like, huh? And she was 62 years old when she wrote it. That floored me more than anything else that I came across because it seemed so <clears throat> not Francis-like. Um, she was an advocate, she was an abolitionist, she was uh, a, a, a lecturer, she was um, all the things that uh, Dorothy Sterling in her uh, book, We Are Your Sisters, says were the gifts that black women had in the 19th century. They worked, they had the commitment to activism and community, and they pushed the envelope on gender and race. And she did all those things. And then she wrote a romance novel. And I was like, hello. So that in itself, to me was the most amazing thing that, um, I found during, uh, doing the research. So um, 
that's my that's my little little nugget <clears throat> that I found amazing. That's excellent. Um, people are exclamation point in the chat about your your nugget a little bit. So Allie, um, your piece was so touching to me. I had a little tear when I read it, and it it's so wonderful. How did you feel when you first opened the book and saw that you were going to be next to Miss Bev? Miss um, essay. So I saw that when we were going over, I think some copy edits, and I flipped out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, well, you know what? I'm sandwiched in between two really great people. So, you know, people are going to have a really great experience on both ends of me. If they see my art, if they even miss my essay, it's okay. It's cool. <laughs> like, if they even remember reading it, it's fine. I just came after like this amazing essay about the history of black literature and romance. And if they remember it, I, I would just be honored, you know? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was stunning for me. <laughs> I bet it's so great. Um, you focused on this very specific memory that you have of being a kid and with your mother, who is plays a big part in your um, piece that you wrote. Do you want to give a little glimpse into that for those that might not have read it yet? <laughs> um, so that is my mother's second favorite story to tell about when I was growing up. Um, just, just one of those things that like kind of define your parenting style. Um, and realizing that number one, you have an extroverted child and you're more of an introvert. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's just, we, we grew, I grew up in the city and I grew up in the downtown part of the city. And at a time when the downtown part of the city wasn't as shiny and fancy as it is now, um, whoever won the annotated uh, copy of the book, I'm gonna send you pictures of what it looked like then and what it looks like now. Um, <laughs> and it, there were all kinds of characters and those characters were my neighbors and um there's there was a certain class of character in my neighborhood frequently they were sex workers who would take respite in the park that my mother and I would go through all the time and you know I'm a naturally apprehensive person but I found somebody who looked like one of my favorite cartoon characters and because she looked like one of my favorite cartoon characters, I was more than comfortable going up to her and giving her a hug. And that was just, and my mom was just like, well, that's weird, but okay. Until she got home and realized why I hugged her because I saw somebody who I liked. And if something that simple can affect a child, you know, just having, I went home and immediately hugged the doll and said, I met Jim Goldstone. Oh my God. And then something that simple can affect your child. You know, you even living in one of the blackest cities on earth, surrounded by black folk all day long, everywhere you go, everyone from, you know, the clerk to the mayor is black. You know, you can be anything you want to be, but the fact that I have this very direct influence on my life that, that, that I would willingly breach you know, all sense of self-preservation to go hug this woman that instilled in her that like, okay, we're going to continue to reinforce that in all ways that loving black people, loving your skin is going to come in you at all times and in all ways. Um, and so that just like kind of kicked off. And then like, you know, my mom has told that story over the years and we laugh about it. Um, but, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I realized what she did was, you know, really radical, um, you know, seeing how parents choose toys for their kids, choose books for their kids. I mean, come on, books at the heart of everything right now. Um, it's, it's important to instill things in your kids that they feel loved and supported at all times mm -hmm. and that they see themselves and that they, they're filled up with that. Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about, and when I was thinking about reading romance, you know, I just kind of came back to that story because loving myself wasn't hard to do when I was younger because I was surrounded by Black people. I was surrounded by people who looked like me. Um, but when I went out into the world, when I left the safety and shelter of where I was from, I didn't always get that. And, but I could pick up a book 
and I could see people who were loved like me and I could read and I could live with these characters and I would remember that love again. That's awesome. That's like, um, I actually bookmarked yours to read just a couple lines out loud. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Um, let's see. Hold on. Um, let's see. So it's the doll all over again. Lessons from my mother. Seeing yourself is good for who you are. Loving the skin you're in is the greatest gift that could be given to you. And I think your mom really did give that to you. And I was really so touched to be able to read that in this book. So thank you. All right. Um, besides writing this essay in the book and writing, um, you also have a podcast alley that covers rom-com and romance films. How do you kind of draw this work into your rom-com I mean okay number one romantic comedies are like I as much as people like to denigrate them and make jokes about them and say that they're nothing everybody loves them like everybody has a one movie that means something to their history or their past and they go to they turn it on like comfort food and it means a lot to people, like those, those familiar beats, it means a lot to them. And really in talking about these movies, I'm talking to people who love romance books specifically. So there's a certain expectation romance readers have, um, and romance readers and writers have of things that say they're rom-com or they're romance. And looking at it more, looking at it more from that point of view, um, you know, where those movies fail us, um, and feeling and, um, and all the love that, you know, we have for these books, why don't we see it necessarily in these movies? And like when everybody's ever talking about like, I'm gonna subvert the genre, which just means stealing all the joy out of it. And, <laughs> you know, you know and, and just on top of that, like just wanting characters to be more reflective of society itself. Like I remember, all the uproar about Shallow Howl when it first came out, which was just, I mean, the, the whole idea that I know the Farley brothers thought they were doing something amazing and romantic by saying that, you know, you can love somebody no matter what they look like. But what they did was really just fat drag and it was deeply offensive to everybody. But, you know, underneath there was still a love story in there that people still connected with. And I think it's important to be critical of these things on the whole and talk about like how we would fix them. Um, but I, I mean, I'm just always thinking about movies too much and books and people hate talking to me. So I got a podcast so I could force people to talk to me. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved being a guest on your podcast. We had so much fun. <laughs> yes, yeah. we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though we talked about, Jess and I talked about uh, 10 Things I Hate About You, which was deeply personal for us <laughs> because we did the play together at uh, Taming of the Shooter in high school. So it was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. Um, so Jess, you wrote the introduction, of course, for, you know, the set of essays, and then you also wrote another one. So can you just give everyone a quick overview of what your personal essay is? Um, I really connected with hearing you talk about, you know, your personal relationship with your spouse and then what your goal was for this um, anthology. Absolutely. So, um, of course, now I know I'm going to mess it up. I believe the essay is titled Interracial Romance and the Single Story. And I think it was going to be called Interracial Romance and the Problem with the Single Story, which just ended up being way too long. <laughs> and if you are familiar with the concept of the single story, it's all about how um, there there is a particular story that is always told 
and it's told to be the representative of an entire group of people and how that shouldn't be the case because no one story should be representative of the entire group of people. And if we keep telling the same story over and over and over again, everyone reading it will believe that that is the representative story of an entire people. And so I am a member of a group of people who are black women married to white men. Um, and there are a lot of romance novels that are also telling stories of black women married to white men or who will eventually be in a relationship with a white man. And um, I really wanted to talk about, I didn't quite get into the, like the history of chattel slavery and all of that stuff that I kind of would if I had wanted to take another five years to write a really good book about it. Um, but um, I sort of talk about not just how the that being the main way that people are entering into diverse romance is really a disservice to this overarching story of black love and you know Miss Bev had to yell at people on Twitter over the weekend about how interracial romance is not black romance um, and also about how the stories that we've been offered in books in film have always sort of made it so the that's the only romance that Black people can be in, is one where we are in a relationship with um, someone who is not Black. And, you know, I mentioned that there are some really great ones um, that I've enjoyed, but that is not Black romance and it is not depiction of Black love, as Ms. Bev talked about, as we saw, as we've seen with our parents, our grandparents, the old people in church who've been together for 50 years the people down the street, the people in the store. Um, you know, if Black people are together, one of them dies. Or maybe we've, um, we've actually seen Black couples in television, in film, but we don't get to see them fall in love. They're just already there. Or we get sort of this sexless Black hero who is, you know, blowing things up and saving the day but he does, doesn't get to experience a really good romantic arc and fall in love with another Black person. Um, so it's like, I, I love interracial romance. I have read countless of them and plan to continue to. And of course, you know, I love my white husband. Um, but there is something to say about the fact that so much of what we're offered is not Black romance. And I just say a really cute Black romance that is slowly playing out on screen night right now is Abbott Elementary. Mm -hmm. It's so cute. It's so cute. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> I mean, and, it, and it's sort of down, you know, yeah, I've been yelling at people and throwing pox on the grass and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but my main concern <clears throat> is the erasure of black men. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, at all they've done for this country, all they've done for their families, all they've done for, and what the mass media would seem to prefer is to portray them as dysfunctional, as predators, as, you know, deadbeat dads, as, you know, instead of the way they're portrayed in black romance as full character people who can do the tender, who can, you know, my husband would buy me flowers every time I finished a book. I mean, you don't get to see that kind of thing on in mass media. I mean, you might, you're seeing a lot more of it now, but it's not as, it's not where it should be. Mm -hmm. I get little pieces here and there, 
But for me, that dynamic is so important because it's not seen enough, uh, which affects our, our young men growing up, which affects our young women growing up. Um, when I, when I, I wrote Bell, my young adult novel, I couldn't believe how many letters I got, this was back before email, um, from the young women who wrote me and said, did they get married? So when we reprinted it, I added chapters to both books with the hero, the young hero and the young heroine getting married because, you know, that's the logical conclusion, at least back then. So it's so important to, as, as Jess says, to, to portray the full picture and not just through one gaze because we're not, you know, we're not a hive mentality. We got black folks doing all kinds of stuff, but by focusing, and there's nothing wrong with IR. I have said that a thousand times, but I wanna see some, some love for black men out there and they're not getting enough, so. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, Piper Hughley's essay in the anthology really hones in on that as well, the erasure of Black men from romance. So when you pick up the book, make sure to read that one because mm -hmm. it's really, really good. All right. Um, I lost my spot on my questions. Here we go. Um, so, I'm sure you've read a few of the other ones in the book. So I'm gonna ask each of you to maybe mention one or two of the other essays that you enjoyed or a piece that you enjoyed from the book that you would wanna point out to those who are going to still read it. Who wants to start? <laughs> of them all. Yeah. I mean, I think they each bring something different to the table and um, that makes them very, very valuable because not everybody's coming from the same place. So. Read them all, buy the book, read them all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. You heard her. <laughs> really hard to pick. So yeah, just buy the book and read everything. And take your time. No, nobody's making you read it all at one time. You can read an essay a day. Mm -hmm. Just like, don't make me do it. <laughs> no, You're making her choose her favorite thing. Oh, okay, That's fine. <laughs> Children. I have to say, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'll say as a library staffer who does reader's advisory, I've been telling all of my library pals that they need to read this as part of their reader's advisory work because it is such a wealth of author names that they can look into and recommend and start building their own, you know, reading map to help steer their patrons to these authors because, you know, I'm just happy to have books that look like my patrons on the shelf so when they are browsing they can see themselves in the selection that we have and this is such a great resource that's so accessible and readable and gives you all that wealth of knowledge and then I'm a big footnote person so I really appreciate having the bibliography in the back so I can go and look up all of those books and start pouring through them myself so thank you for including those things. <laughs> Absolutely. There were some really great foot and end notes in um, some of the, some of, some of the essays. And you'll notice that I didn't pull all of Miss Bev's um, references into the back because <laughs> there were so many. It's just like, why don't you just, you know, read that one over and over again and find all of them. Um, and they were so clearly put together that I didn't have to pull them out of the text like I did for some other people. Mm -hmm. um, and Hannah's essay, uh, Sarah Hannah Gomez, was the only one I actually left the footnotes in in the body of the text because they added so much to actually jumping down to read like her little, her little asides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. So good. People are saying you read one of Miss Bev's and then you end up buying three more. <laughs> good job. 
Um, and I just want to remind everyone to continue. If you have questions for our panelists, just keep putting them in the Q&A box as we go along and have time to cover those. Um, let's see, something I always have to ask people that come to our programs is how the library or your library life has kind of played an impact in your writing life, in your career, your research, just a fun library story because our patrons always like to hear those. <laughs> Anyone want to start? <laughs> I mean, I forget, I just forget, I feel like somebody asked on Twitter once about like, what was your childhood library like and like I mentioned mine had a reading cave and I went into that cave well into my teenage years so <laughs> I mean library is always there for me um, I conveniently live like down the street from my library now like two blocks so I am in there all the time and I am one of those power usage that people hate because I am a member of like every library system within the DC metropolitan area. So <laughs> I am I'm collecting libraries like they are Pokemon. Um beware. We'll be on the lookout for you. <laughs> <laughs> well Jess and Ms. Bev, you both Jess, you currently work in a library and Ms. Bev, you did. So um for me, and I've said this a thousand times. The best gift you can give a child is a library card. Um, growing up with lots of love, more love than money, growing up in, in, on the east side of Detroit. Um, libraries, or as, as we used to call it, the library made a big difference in my life. I read everything in my neighborhood library, everything, every book. Um, and all of those voices, I think, went into to my writing and making me who I am today. Um, as I said, I didn't plan on being a writer. All I ever want to do is work in my library. That's all I want to do. And sometimes the universe will give you what you ask for. And then also say, here, put this hat on. This hat, hat. right? <laughs> Um, so here I am, but give a kid a library card and they're fucking free. Come on now. Um, let them take journeys around the world and meet people that they may not meet on their block or, or may not meet at church or may not meet in their school because everybody has stories to tell. And if you are got more love than money in your life, one of the best ways to find this out is through libraries. So I cry a lot when I talk about libraries. <laughs> well, like like you said, Beth, I I work in a library now. And actually, funnily enough, I had a semi-contentious relationship with libraries as a kid. I always went on school trips and stuff and would check out books and then um, not be really good at returning them. <laughs> so I would I would sort of um, take them back when I remembered or maybe go back on Amnesty Day or let the library forget I existed and then move away and move back and then get a <laughs> brand new library card with a brand new record, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but nowadays, I um, I work with some amazing people, and I uh, got to join the readers advisory team, even though I don't work in public service. So that's really cool, and I have um, turned so many of my colleagues into romance readers, and it's the best thing. Even just this past week, you know, we do a little book share at the end of our readers advisory team meetings and a new librarian who is also a guy was like, I love your enthusiasm for romance whenever you talk about it. And I just picked up my first one. and I'm excited to read it. And it's like, yay. Um, and so, um, and as far as writing, like both of the people who have really gotten me into regularly writing in Tucson are both people I met through the library. So 
if I did not work at the library that I currently do, I don't know what my life would be like. Awesome. But it's awesome. Spreading the good romance word around. I I feel like I've done that with some of my coworkers who are in the chat right now. Oh, that's what Lydia just said. <laughs> just being enthusiastic about what we love you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so um it's 7 45 i'm gonna again um remind everyone if you have questions for anyone here tonight to please put those in the q a um or even comments that you'd want me to read out loud um, to our special guests um before we get to the questions i'm gonna ask each of you do you have um an author that you're currently reading or a book or a tv show that you've been enjoying you know during these times or what are you working on next professionally anything you wanted to share um Allie, why don't you start oh thanks <laughs> uh yeah i mean like beth mentioned we're doing the rom-com bracket now bianca hernandez is uh, at recording on twitter um she does this rom-com bracket every year and she asked me this year would it be up for hosting so if you have passionate opinions about uh, romantic comedies um follow the twitter tag uh, hashtag rom-com bracket um, and vote your hearts away. There's a new poll every day. Um, we're down to 32. So we're on to the second round. Um, again, I have uh, podcast episodes coming out. Um, I actually have one for one of our fellow contributors, Carol V. Bell, coming out this week. Um, so keep your eyes tuned for that. Um, the podcast is on all the podcatchers you can find. So Find it wherever you like to listen. All right. Miss Babb, do you want to go next? Um, I am supposed to be um, in final edits for the uh, new historical that will be out in August. Uh, it's called How to Catch a Raven. And she's a grifter. And they're looking for a stolen copy of the Declaration of Independence. And then after that, well, right behind that, I have to finish Blessings 11, which is a Christmas to remember, which will be out in October. And then I'm gonna fall the hell out. So <laughs> probably try and catch my breath and uh, get ready for whatever is coming next. Love it. You deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just read your Rare Danger, which is about the rare books librarian, which you can get now. It's a novella length. It was so much fun. I loved it when he had the helicopter. <laughs> it's one of the great things about doing the, the suspense for me is I get to blow stuff up. And have mm -hmm. It was super action packed. I definitely recommend everyone check that one out right away because you can get it now. <laughs> All right, Jess. Um, well, I will continue shouting the gospel of Abbott Elementary with um, everyone here and everyone in the chat. And I am still slowly making my way through the most recent um, season of Star Trek Discovery, which is, has a lovely romantic arc that mm -hmm. I have been enjoying. Um, and a I am between books. I just finished um, Sky Falling by Mia McKenzie, which is, isn't a capital R romance, but does have um, a romantic element in it. And it's also um, a story about that, that Black community um, in Philly and with um, friends and family and all of, the, all of the joys and traumas that come with it. And it's really good. So um, it, I... I posted somewhere online, the internet, um, I can't remember which place, with all of the content notes for it, because there's a lot, but if you can get through all of those, then it's a really great and funny book, um, and I just want to, like, I want to talk to people about it, because I, I came late to it, I should have read it, you know, a million years ago, but that is actually the story of my future memoir. I should have read it a million years ago, the Jessica Pride story. So. <laughs> I think that's all of us. Yeah. Yes. 
(laughs) I was just musing about being 12 years old and being this voracious reader that was worried I was going to run out of books at my library to read. And now in pushing 40 and I'm like, I don't have enough time to read all the books that I want to read. So that kind of had switched. I'm like, oh, 12 year old me would be so thrilled I get to talk to amazing authors like all of you and have a key to the library now. I have a key. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Ab- Abbott Elementary on TV is fantastic. I watch it with um, my spouse and my two kids who are five and ten and we all laugh really hard. So it's one of those really awesome, smart and funny shows that you can enjoy with everyone. Yay. All right. Um, we do have some questions. Lydia, did you want to read any of those out loud? Absolutely. Apologies in advance for any mispronunciations, but Allie asks, have your reading habits changed during the pandemic? She knows she's consumed orders more, magnitude of romance, especially touch starved characters during the pandemic. Um, I think for me, I got into audiobooks more. Um, especially when like grocery shopping turned into like weird um, excursions. Uh, so listening to audiobooks while I did that made it um, calming uh, for me. I do that I- all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, Allie. Uh, Esther asks, which romance trope do you go to for comfort? I love Marriage of Convenience, as you probably know from my books. I absolutely adore that. So that's my go-to. <clears throat> and friends and enemies to lovers. I'm a fake relationship or stuck together person. And if they're together those those two tropes together then I'm definitely going to grab it yeah I am big on fake dating yeah love a fake dating story in 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 book in movie oh let's pretend that we're dating but we don't really like each other we just like being really near each other and pretending that and having to touch each other and kiss each other but this is fake. This isn't real. No, no. Let's continue to lie to ourselves. Yes, I love that. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> she best. Oh, me. Um, let's see. My new favorite, which seems so I've been kind of leaning into the anxiety reading lately before I was seeking a lot of comfort but now I'm like I want to feel something so I've been reading a lot of second chance romance so marriage in trouble second chance they had a bad past happen and now they are going to reconnect and I knowing that that HEA is coming I can sit in the discomfort of the actual story and it's like oh yeah it's really good I'm reading a really good one right now by um I think it's K period LaShawn. It's very, very spicy and very good, but very angsty because they're divorced, but he, they both clearly still love each other. And they're like, we'll just, you know, get together for a wink, <laughs> but they're going to get back together. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So Allie, Lisa wants to ask if you've talked about Abbott Elementary on your podcast yet. No, so we typically stick to movies, though I do kind of want to delve into some like romance specific TV shows um, as well. Like, um, oh my gosh, I am blanking on the name, but it literally has love in the title on Amazon Prime that uh, is about like, it's three stories around like different family members and they're at all like different stages of love. I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it's like, I think it's with love. Um, mm-hmm. It all takes place around different holidays and it's a big uh, let, uh, uh, let, let, let next family. And like, they start at New Year's Eve and it's like, it's really fun. And if you haven't watched it, it's so great. Um, like one of the cousins is uh, 
Afro-Latino who is an ER doctor and she is trying to start a relationship with another ER doctor and you know they have these like crazy schedules where they can't meet and like it's not angsty it's just like really comforting and like it's really delightful and there's like these two characters who are missing each other or they, they have actually no they have a really bad um meeting in the first episode but they get together it, you just have you have to check it but it's yeah I think it's called with love um but <laughs> I'd really love to talk to somebody about that one on the podcast somebody in the chat was like yeah it's with love so maybe they would want to do that <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question from Foon Me for Miss Bev. What is your favorite historical time period or era to write in? Um, 19th century, of course, um, either before the Civil War or after, because of the bittersweet um, years and the bittersweet experiences. We had our highs, we had our lows, but we kept loving. We kept loving on each other. So um, 19th century, Reconstruction, Civil War, the wild, wild west. <laughs> That's my answer. Wonderful. Thank you all for your questions and thank you all for your answers. I think that's all we have. Awesome. Right on time. Um, any last thoughts from everyone before we wrap up for the evening and get on our ways? <laughs> Write a book. <laughs> Read the book. Read the book. Buy a book for your library so that they can not have a thousand people waiting on two copies. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently number two for the audio at my library. <laughs> I have heard the audio is very good. Isn't there multiple narrators for the mm -hmm. audiobook? So if you prefer yeah. that way, definitely check I it out. I think there are five. Something like that. Okay. Awesome. Good. Well, I just want to personally say thank you to each of you for your time and your expertise and for joining us tonight. We're on a bunch of different time zones, so I really can do appreciate it when we can make these things work out for our Milwaukee Public Library patrons. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to urge everyone who's here, you can check out more amazing programs with the Milwaukee Public Library at mpl.org. You will receive an email in a couple of days with a link to the recording and other great things that you can check out with Milwaukee Public Library, either if you live here or if you don't, doesn't matter. Um, we do have a really awesome Black History Month reading challenge going on, which this book, if you read it, would count as one of your entries. So I urge you to give it a try. There's really great prizes. Um, that is all on our website as well. So Thanks again, everyone, and have an amazing evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.